You've been asked to set up depreciation schedules on Excel, so let's look at what your end product ought to look like, but I'm not actually going to tell you what your formula should be. I'm just going to give you some guidance. So you should have an input area, and it doesn't have to look like this, but you certainly should probably have, you know, your cost of 45000 and your salvage value of 4500 in the data input. So above all the depreciation schedules, you should have a data input area that consists of cost and salvage value. And again, you can include the details of the specific assets, or you can just show the total cost and salvage value. And we've talked about earlier that market value was irrelevant, so we don't need to put it there. And you may also want uh, in your data input area to already solve for the 40500 the amount to be depreciated. So, you know, when you finish, really these are what your numbers should look like. And uh, you do not have to have the lines that I've drawn here. That's just because that fit with the assignment handout and I kept them in uh, my particular spreadsheet. But you don't need to do that. So you don't have to have all these numbers underlined. But you should have formulas that, you know, by your second row, everything should just be a formula from row two on down, formula after formula, and so that you should just create a formula and copy it down and get these ending results. Likewise with some of your digits, uh, either by the first or the second year, you should have formulas in place that are consistent that you can just copy all the way down. And let's look at the additional items, double declining balance. Again, starting with that second year, you should have a formula here for your depreciation expense. Uh, you can go back to the video when we first talked about depreciation, how to, you know, use that if function uh, and set up, you know, uh, your, you know, whether something's going to be true or not. So your logic, set in your logic uh, parameters. And, you know, what would the formula be? What's this number going to be if it's true? And what should it be if it's false? And again, I've already lectured over that, so I'm not going to go over it in great detail. I just wanted to follow up. Here's ultimately what it should look like. Of course, you're not going to have this note. But you should get this number. And again, everything should just be a copied formula. Makers, that's right out of your textbook, and you could get those there. The main thing, notice the difference under makers your depreciation, the total cost of the asset, not just the amount to be depreciated. And the other interesting thing, uh, even though if uh, tax law may stipulate, you know, per particular asset is a five-year asset, but it's actually depreciated over six years because in the first and the last year, you only have, you know, a half-year depreciation. And the same thing for th a three-year asset. That first year, doesn't matter if you buy it in January, June, or December, you only get, you get, well only, you get a half year's depreciation. Uh, uh, again, whether you've only held it a day or 365 days, you get half a year's depreciation. So you have to follow it up in year four with another half year to get a full three years. Okay, the other thing I want to talk about on this recording is, uh, you know, what do you do if you buy the asset uh, in the middle of the year? So I'm going to assume that we bought these pieces of equipment on October 1 of the first year. So let's say we bought it on the first year. How would that change the annual depreciation expense? So I'm going to demonstrate this with some of your digits. And by the way, this I'm not going to use exercise 3 for it because it's easier. You've all done these numbers. I'm just going to use these numbers since you're all familiar with it. Um, and it'll be very similar application of it in exercise three. So I have taken the numbers for some of the year's digits and I just wrote them out. Uh, I couldn't write small enough on the prior screen of the depreciation schedule, but I really think you probably can squeeze these numbers. I mean, you've already got these on your Excel spreadsheet. And uh, so if you've printed that out, you know, just use that printout and you can follow along or pull out a blank sheet of paper pause my video and write this down. So here's the thing. What I said is we're going to assume we bought this asset on October 1. So what difference would that make? Well, if we buy it on October 1, we won't have a full year's depreciation that first year. So how do we, how do we calculate depreciation expense for year one? Does that change, 
you know, remember in year one, we took 515 times the amount to be depreciated, that 40,500 to get this 13.5. In year two, we did the 14.15s and then on down. So, you know, does that change that, that uh, fraction? Well, the answer to that is no. So here's what you do if you have a partial year. First step is to do just what we did. Solve for annual depreciation uh, just based on the asset itself. So the first year of the asset's life, year one, of course it's not gonna be X1, but year one, the depreciation for a full year for that asset would be 10,800. For year two of that asset's life, when it started on October 1, is 10,800 and just all the way down. So again, I wouldn't say those are calendar years, but again, figure out the years according to the asset itself. So I do the same thing. I figure out what would be, for the first whole year of the asset's life, its depreciation expense. So, you know, so, so that's gonna be step one and it's important that you do that, by the way. Then we're just gonna allocate like we would any expense. So in the first year, um, let's see, October, November, December, three twelfths of that applies to 2000X1. So uh, 13,500 times three twelfths is 3,375. And that's going to be our depreciation for 2000X1. Now, for the 13,500, nine twelfths of that applies, nine twelfths of that applies to 2000X2. So 13,500 times 9 twelfths is 10,125. So I've just taken the 13,500 and we have determined this amount belongs to 2000X1, this amount belongs to 2000X2. Now of the 10,800, 3 twelfths of that belongs to 2000X2, right? So uh, 3 twelfths of 10,800 is $2,700. But there's another nine months that belongs to the following year. So 10,800 times 9 twelfths is $8,100. So that belongs to 2000X3. And then I just keep doing that. Uh, of the, uh, of the 8100, 3 twelfths of that belongs to 2000X3. So 3 twelfths times 8100 is 2025. And then 9 twelfths belongs to the following year. 9 twelfths of 8100 is 6,075. And then of the fourth year of the assets life, 3 twelfths of that belongs to 2000X4. So 3 twelfths of 5400 uh, is 1,350. And then 9 twelfths belongs to the following year. And that's going to be 4050 And then of the 2700 3 twelfths belongs to the fifth year, which is 675 Okay, and then lastly, 9 twelfths is going to belong to the following year, 2025 and that's 2000X6. If I add all of this up, you're going to get 40500 And so here's my depreciation expense for X1. If I add these two together, I'll get $12,825. So, you know, we're going to debit depreciation expense for that amount have a depreciation expense for that amount and credit accumulated depreciation. Just our standard journal entry for depreciation. Debit the expense uh, for these amounts that we arrive at. 
Okay, 2000x3, that's going to total 10,125. 2000x4, 7,425. 2000x5, 4,725. And then 2000x6, 2,025. And let me just move this over so we have them all over here. Okay, so here's 2000x1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And those would be your annual dollar amount of going into your journal entry for depreciation expense. So it's really pretty simple as long as you recognize there's two components. Step one, what's the annual depreciation? And step two, you know, assign it based on, you know, the months used. And lastly on this recording, I want to look at exercise 12 out of chapter 11. I try, sorry, I tried to copy it here. I see that it didn't scan very well. Uh, so you may not be able to read that, but go to your textbook and look at exercise 12. Um, I'll go through and I'll tell you the details. The details are that this company uh, acquired a building and started using it in 1988. The cost of that building was $2 million and at that time they estimate, estimated salvage value to be $60,000. So they expect to depreciate $1,940,000. Over 40 years, that's $48,500 annually. Okay, and then we're going to jump forward 28 years later to 2016. 28 years later, uh, they're going to change the estimated life. And we'll get to that here in a little bit. So here we have 1988, and for the first 10 years, there would have been annual depreciation expense of 48500 The next thing that actually happens is in 1998. So we go from 1988 to 1998, and they add on to the building. That addition cost $500,000 with the salvage of $20,000. So $480,000 of that needs to be depreciated over the asset's life. Now notice when I depreciated, you know, divided it by the number of years, I divided it by the number of years remaining in the building's life. So again, 10 years have gone by, so there's only 30 years left. So the annual depreciation expense for uh, the addition is $16,000. So, oops, sorry about that. I have the wrong thing there. Uh, wrong tool. All right. So, uh, if we add these two together, the annual depreciation expense from 1998 on was $64,500. So, it, for the first 10 years, it was 48500 and then from 1998 on, it was 64500 Okay, now, so let's jump forward then. For both of these items, uh, we have a cost here for the building of $2 million. It's accumulated depreciation. I just took the 48500 times 28 years to get the accumulated depreciation of $1,358,000. And again, I had to calculate that. And I netted those together to get a book value of 642000 I did the same thing over here with the addition. The original cost is $500,000. Uh, 18 years later, right, for it, 18 years later, uh, from 1998 to two th the beginning of 2016, so it doesn't include t 2016, it's the beginning of 2016. So 18 years later, accumulated depreciation would be the 16000 times 18 years, 288000 for a book value of 212 Now, the company did not change salvage value in either case, but if they had, I would put the updated salvage value here, but they don't. So, they're leaving salvage value for the building at 16000 and likewise over here, they're leaving it at 20000 So, I'm just, you know, go forward. Uh, there is, so once we change the estimate, there's no actual journal entry for the change in estimate. Uh, we're just going to calculate the new amount of depreciation expense. So going forward, at the beginning of 2016, for the building, there's $582,000 left to be depreciated. 
And for the addition, uh, there's $192,000 remaining to be depreciated. Right? So now I'm just going to depreciate it, over, depreciate it over the remaining life. Uh, and here in 2016, uh, they anticipate that they will use the asset an additional 20 years beyond their original estimate. So their original estimate was 40 years. They're going to add another 20 years to make it 60. So, you know, uh, I could take uh, 60, 60 minus uh, 28 years that we've already depreciated, and then I would just divide this by the 32. 32 years now is our new estimate. Uh, the other way is I could see, okay, there's 12 years left, uh, 12 years left, and we're going to add another 20 to that to get my 32 years. So whether I do 60 is the new estimate minus the 28 we've already depreciated for 32 years left, or I can just think, okay, there was 12 left in the original estimate, we're going to add 20 to that to get 32. But whatever I do, I'm going to now, my revised annual depreciation expense is 18188 That's a big difference, isn't it? So they are really reducing their depreciation expense. If you think they went from, you know, 48400 now down to this, that's a big drop in the expense. Likewise, uh, we will divide this by 32 years and we'll get $6,000. You know, and again, if I add those together, I'm going to get a total depreciation expense of $24,188. So my debit to depreciation expense and my credit to accumulate depreciation for 2016 will be this $24,188. Now, I've also made a comment. There's no journal entry for the change itself. Okay, it is, you know, prior period adjustment. So the accountant really is trying to discern, is this a prior period adjustment? We have to go back and change depreciation for prior years uh, and kind of recoup some of that to depreciate it into the future. And if we do that, and that's depreciation expense is close to retained earnings, and then I got to go back and change, you know, my beginning retained earnings. We don't do that. This is not a change in estimate is not considered a prior period adjustment. Recall prior period adjustments are when we make accounting errors, and if we change our estimate, it is not considered an error because back in 1988, 40 years was a reasonable estimate. At that time, it was not an error to use 40 years. It was, if it was a reasonable estimate, then changing our mind 28 years later uh, is not, was, you know, not an error correction. What's happened is that 28 years have gone by, we have more information about the asset, having used it for 28 years, and we're able to change our estimate. So again, we just have better information as time went by, so we're going to change our estimate, but that's not a correction of an error. So the problem asks you for the journal entry, which is a trick question, because there isn't actually uh, a journal entry for that. Uh, but had there been an error in the calculation, if we had made an error in this calculation, we would have a journal entry for the prior period adjustment.